delighted that Les Payne is here this evening and the circumstances that brought us here are very interesting. Um, this past uh, March, I was exhibiting at the, an art show over at the piers um, called the Armory Show, and in the booth was a Barbara Chase Rabu sculpture. And Les was in the booth with his wife, and we were chatting mm -hmm. and having a nice visit. And he mentioned to me about that he's been working on a Malcolm X book. And being the shameless gallery owner who was looking for every opportunity possible <laughs> to bring people into the gallery and to promote my artist, but also a, a new friend, I said to Les, well, you know, Barbara Chase Rebu's sculpture is standing right here, and I don't know if you're familiar with her Malcolm X series, and the Malcolm X series is Barbara's most famous body of work, and examples of the Malcolm X series are in major institutions such as the Philadelphia Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so we thought it would be a wonderful opportunity for bring people into the gallery to see Barbara's work and for Les to speak about his book and his experiences and thoughts about Malcolm X. And so here we are in this Malcolm X world. And um, I'm just going to quickly, hopefully quickly, introduce Les. Um, and Les Payne is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, editor, and a social critic. In the late 1960s, he joined Newsday to serve as the associate managing editor for the paper's National Science and International News. And in 1968, as an investigative reporter, he covered the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. And in the 1970s, he reported on the Black Panther Party and, of course, every other major event taking place in the country. Um, and Les Payne is the author of The Life and Death of the Symbionese Liberation Army, and he won a Pulitzer Prize in 1974 for his multi-part series, The Heroin Trail. He has reported extensively from Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and the United Nations. And during the historic Soweto Uprising in 1976, he tra traveled throughout South Africa and wrote a series that was nominated for another Pulitzer Prize in foreign reporting. Um, Les also covered the 1990 release of Nelson Mandela and the Rhodesia-Zimbabwe guerrilla war and the Tanzania-Uganda war and is reported from a dozen other sub-Saharan countries. As one of the 1975 founders mm -hmm. and fourth president of the National Association of Black Journalists, Les Payne has worked diligently to improve racial fairness, media employment practices, and to expand coverage of black communities and the third world countries. Um, Les has received several awards, including the prestigious ACE Award, which is cable television's highest honor, in 1990, and he was the 1998 inaugural professor for the David Laventhal Chair at Columbia University's Graduate School of Journalism. And after nearly 40 years at Newsday, um, Les officially retired in 2008. And he was a former CBS TV panelist on Sunday Edition, and he's also appeared on numerous network programs. I'm not even gonna list them all. From Nightline and Meet the Press and Go to Morning America, you know it all. Yeah. Anyway, and, um, and in 2016, Les Payne was in, inducted into the Long Island Journalism Hall of Fame. And Les has been working on a biography on Malcolm X, and I hope we're going to hear a little bit about that tonight from this very distinguished journalist. And um, thank you, Les. Wow. Well, thank you, Michael, for that splendid introduction. I think I should quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> uh, and I'd also like to thank you for inviting me here uh, this evening to uh, say a few remarks uh, about the historical figure that Barbara Chase Rebeau has chosen to salute. And Malcolm X, even all these years later, uh, is a little tricky when you're saluting him, uh, especially in this day of our present president. So uh, you might receive some tweets after, but you know, pass them along. <laughs> I, uh, 
I had the great privilege of attending the opening uh, reception here with Barbara Chase Rebo when she uh, had her exhibit opening this time around. And uh, I mean, I was just, I mean, I'm, as was said uh, in, the, in the introduction, you know, I've been around, I'm a world travel, globe trotting journalist in my younger days. Uh, and I've met a lot of world leaders. I've also met a lot of artists and sculptures and writers. But seldom have I met all three of those combined in one person. Because I'd long been familiar with Barbara Chase Rebo's uh, uh, award-winning poetry. Uh, of course, had read her work on Sally Hemings. I think we all have, yes, you know, <laughs> and have our views. I was talking to someone who had her view, <laughs> and we have our views. But I, she got the conversation started. I mean, that was the historian before her, but I remember back when I read that, and I mean, it was all the talk, Sally Hemings, is it true, is it not true? She, it, was a, it, it was a novel, of course, and the big question was, uh, was it true or was it not true? My literary agent just arrived, so uh, I can't tell you anything about the book. <laughs> you know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, I, I, was, I was really impressed with her because, uh, you know, she has combined so many talents. And I must say that I was not totally familiar with her, with her artwork. I mean, I had seen a piece or two uh, here and there. And in uh, another general way, I want to uh, uh, offer my appreciation and congratulations also to Michael uh, Rosenfeld for, in the first instance, having promoted over the last few decades African-American art uh, because I was talking to Walt Evans who's a good buddy of mine we've been buddies since our childhood uh, in, in Hartford you know he was up from Savannah and I was up from Tuscaloosa Alabama anybody from Tuscaloosa <laughs> even you, you wouldn't admit it I know <laughs> but at any rate and uh, so I, we, we were talking about this and he said it was you know Michael Rosenfeld has been uh, almost single-handedly in mainstream uh, art dealership responsible for uh, pushing African-American art, which, as you know, gets lost sometimes. And uh, I'm just flat. I hope you've all had a chance to look at uh, uh, Ms. Rebeau's uh, art pieces. I mean, it's just splendid. You know, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm into abstract art. And I'm, I'm told that, uh, that the art uh, is called... Uh, I hope I pronounce this right, steels. Is that it? Steelays, some call it. Some call it steelays, some call it steel. Yes? It's all good. It's all good. Okay. <laughs> it's it, it steels. And, and, and by that, and I understand that Barbara Chase Rebo is, is quite insistent that you not view these abstract pieces as being portraits of Malcolm X, that they are really dedicated to him. Uh, as a figure, that's what steels are. I mean, historically, uh, as all of you know, it's a non-representative sculpture uh, that is not intended to depict qualities about the subject. Uh, they're not portraits, as it were. And I've been told yet again that she is very strong in insisting and emphasizing that viewers should not view these pieces, even the ones on Malcolm X, uh, and attribute specific attributes about Malcolm X. However, since she is not here, <laughs> I'm going to take the liberty to uh, give a name to one of them, and that is uh, uh, the one number 16. That one. That for me has, despite its steel definition, has kind of an anthropomorphic uh, reach. And I dubs it, dubbed it Detroit Red. <laughs> and I tricked uh, Barbara Chase Rebeau to pose by it. That's her there. I'm sure many of you have met her. Uh, but I wanted her to pose with that one in particular because that really struck me, you know, as Detroit Red. Most of you, all of you, I'm sure, know about uh, Malcolm's life, and I won't spend time uh, re reviewing uh, uh, Malcolm's life for you. Uh, but I was just struck by how strong and how bold uh, that one uh, happened, to, uh, happened to be. So, 
So I'm, I'm not, again, since my, my agent is here, I'm not going to promote uh, the upcoming Malcolm X biography, which is due next year, by the way. But what I would like to do, nor am I going to criticize other biographies unless you insist. <laughs> what I would like to do with the time I have is to briefly summarize the life of Malcolm X, this historical figure, to survey a range of people that he has influenced and that he continued to influence. And I'd also like to contract, contrast briefly Malcolm's ever so briefly with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. And finally, since we have some church people here, I notice, uh, I would like to close with a personal testimony. You know how that goes, with a personal testimony about the time that I met Malcolm as a student in college and the effect that it had on me because the effect that Malcolm has on people over time, it varies uh, uh, depending on what your circumstance happened to be. Let me just say that initially, uh, during my early days as a reporter, I had no interest in writing a book on Malcolm X. I used to read his autobiography about every three years. In fact, I have many dog-eared copies, paperback. I couldn't afford the hardbacks in those days, or now. <laughs> But I had many dog-eared copies because, you know, the original one did not have a, 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 a table of contents, so you had to kind of put little slips of paper in them. And I used to read them. Every two or three years, I would read the autobiography and had no intentions ever. I figured between the autobiography and the book Malcolm X Speaks, and back then I used to listen to, uh, some of you may remember, there were uh, 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 LPs with his speeches on them, between the LPs and later cassettes and later CDs, I figured that was all we needed to know about Malcolm. Uh, there were three shooters, you know, who, took, who killed him, who shot him at the Autobahn ballroom, and there were three people serving time in prison. So I figured there was nothing to do, nothing else to add for me. So I went about merrily about my way. Of course, we find out later that two of the convicted murderers were not even in the Autobahn ballroom when Malcolm was killed, which began to uh, caution me that perhaps some more work needed to be done uh, uh, about him. Uh, but still, I, the way I got interested in his life beyond just reading about him and being influenced by his life and being as so many others uh, concerned about his conversion and how he came from being an, an ex-convict you know, to someone who is an uh, uh, international freedom fighter, depending on, 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 your, on your view, uh, is that I was in Detroit. In fact, I was in Detroit with Walt Evans, who's a major collector, and I met uh, Malcolm's brother. And I, we were at a cocktail party, and so I talked with him, and uh, he began to talk about their childhood. And I said, hey, that's very interesting. I don't know anything about this. So I said, can I come to your house tomorrow and we can talk some more? And he said, fine. So I went to his house the next day and taped eight hours of conversation with him about their childhood, what it was like growing up, how did he relate to his mother, where was he when the, when the, the father you know, was killed, where was Malcolm when the father was killed, what was the family like living you know, in, in Omaha and then East Lansing, Michigan, and what were the school days like, how did he relate to, because they were one of the few black families in the area, how did he really relate quite beyond the autobiography? And he was telling me all of this, none of which I knew, because in autobiography, Malcolm, as you know, wrote it essentially to uh, advance the nation of Islam and to uh, uh, giving all praises to Elijah Muhammad. And so I came back and I, and I talked to Gil Noble, and uh, you know, Gil Noble used to do on his Sunday show uh, a piece on, on, on Malcolm's birthday, and then on the day he was assassinated, uh, Gil would do uh, a major takeout, you know, on Malcolm X. And so I came back very excited, and I said, Billy, I talked, uh, I talked to his brother, and, and I don't know anything about this childhood of his. And so uh, Gil said, well, which brother did you talk to? And I said, well, I talked to Philbert. He said, I don't know that brother. He said, the brother you really have to talk to is Wilford. So, okay, <laughs> so I went back, trudging back to Detroit to look down, look up Wilford. And so I looked at, now the difference is that uh, Philbert was two years older than Malcolm and Wilford was six years older than Malcolm. And so we began to see the difference uh, in terms of their uh, point of view. For instance, when uh, the, and, and there's been some argument about whether or not 
the Klan actually rode out on Malcolm's mother when Malcolm's mother was pregnant with him. That's, you know, if you read, if you read Bruce Ferry's biography, again, I said I'm gonna talk about it, but here I am. <laughs> but if you read Bruce Ferry's biography, he says it didn't happen. He said the Klan did not ride out, you know, that that was all apocryphal. Uh, and Man Manny Marable, who depended heavily on Bruce Perry, split the difference between autobiography and said, well, it could have happened. So let's give it a couple of paragraphs. Well, it concerned me greatly because I thought we, we needed to know this. And so, and, and again, perhaps I should say that the difference between, I'm not going to uh, uh, criticize the previous biographies written on him, but one of the things that I will say is that uh, uh, two of them, uh, two of the, of the uh, writers of the biography were, were historians. And God knows there's nothing wrong with being a historian, but I'm not one. <laughs> I'm not a historian, I'm not a scholar, I'm a journalist. Uh, and the difference between our approaches is worth noting uh, because I say, you know, and I think the record will show that historians uh, can read four books and without doing much other reporting, write a fifth book. Um, and journalists, we can't do that. In other words, if you go to the plains of the Serengeti, uh, those of you who've been to it, I was just talking to someone who is smiling because she's just got back from a trip to Africa. But if you go to the plains of the Serengeti, for the difference between the, 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 the two species of the journalists and the historians, I think it could be said that the historian um, is something of a scavenger, no uh, offense intended. Uh, but the writer, the journalist, uh, we are not scavengers. We have to kill our own meat. We have to kill our own meat. So I can't read four books and write a fifth book. But we are usually interested, and I see another great journalist in the back, who, who are interested in what is new about a situation. So what interests me about Malcolm's life is what I didn't know. I wasn't interested in giving my version of what we do know. I was interested in finding out those questions that I did know. When, whenever uh, someone in, in the book says, perhaps we will never know what the FBI did here, that's when our eye, ears perk up as journalists. And that's when I uh, became uh, interested. For instance, just to, since I, I brought it up, the idea about the Klan riding down or not, you know, that's the opening scene of Spike Lee's movie and it's the opening scene of Malcolm's uh, book, Autobiography, as well. And so, but it was a puzzle to me. He said, wait a minute, okay, we have uh, two versions. One book says it happened, the autobiography, and another biography, well-researched many, many years later by a noted scholar who did an extreme amount of work, said it didn't happen. So, what are we to make of this? So I talked to, thanks to Gil Noble, Wilford, who, when this happened, was six years old. And he described to me verbatim over a period of time what as a six-year-old kindergarten student he remembers the Klan coming out. He remembers what his mother was wearing. He remembers the babies crying. Uh, it's just, that's the kind of work that I cite just as being the difference between the two genres. And I tell you, it's really chilling, you know, because here is this man and some call revolutionary that we know as Malcolm, who was born under these circumstances, being yet, you know, carried by his mother as a clan, uh, riding out, threatening her, asking for the husband. And uh, Wolf said the husband, his father, at first he, he, was, he wanted his father to be home. His father was not home. His father was, was away uh, in Milwaukee, which is probably good for him. So the auto autobiography did not emphasize a larger, richer, and more complete life of the, of, the, of the scion of a Garveyite family who would help turn black Americans' eyes toward Africa as a global human rights freedom fighter. And by the way, this is a major difference between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam, because even when he was in the Nation of Islam, he, he was still Malcolm. He was still this scion of a Garveyite family. For instance, the Nation of Islam, uh, because Elijah Muhammad grew up in Georgia at the turn of the last century, uh, where Africa was not looked upon proudly, so he wouldn't refer to Africa at all. Uh, in fact, Malcolm said, quite frankly, you, you can read anything that Elijah Muhammad wrote, he never mentioned Africa, because Africa was a no-no. 
And so Malcolm didn't, in fact, when you talk to him, he said, he said we were, that African Americans as we know us now, uh, were Asiatic black men. And I talked to John Ali, who was the secretary once, and I asked John Ali, I said, you know, the relation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad referred to uh, African Americans as Asiatic black men. I said, what are they, what do they look like? And so we were all over Chicago and finally, finally, and then finally, you know, we were, he said, you know, it's, he's about my complexion. He said, he, the, the Asiatic black man can be as dark as you and I. He said, but he has hair like your eyebrows. I said, holy cow. And so at the end, we were on the way to the airport. He finally said, I want to take you by and show you this Asiatic black man. It was a Bangladeshi. So I said, oh, that's where it was. But all through this, uh, so what, my point simply is that Malcolm had his own mind. He had his own compass. He had his own baggage with him, even when he was in the Nation of Islam, which was no question uh, a cult. And uh, so when Spike, Mo Spike Lee's movie came out, and thank God for Spike Lee, because he introduced Malcolm to another generation, a younger generation, uh, of, of people who otherwise would not have known about Malcolm in, in the, uh, his movie came out in 93, 94. And at about that time, you know, my agent, you know, uh, it was, still wasn't my idea, kind of suggested that I might attempt a biography. And that's how the whole thing uh, came to be for me. So, um, first off, let me just say that anyone writing about Malcolm, you can't get around the autobiography. It is a major, it is one of the great nonfiction books of the 20th century. I mean, everyone, you know, uh, from Random House to you name it, will agree with that. It's one of the great books, and in, in, in people read it white, black, or otherwise, you know, are really cannot get through that book without being influenced by its power, by its force. Um, and so when you write about him, you can't get, a, get around it because it's like when the Indians used to roll the boulder down in front of the stagecoach. You just have to find a way to get around it. So, but but you, 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 you have to uh, relate to it. So the question is for me and, 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 and for people who, who ask often, uh, so what with all those 20 years you've been working and reporting and researching uh, have you found? And I, I will tell you a lot, some of which I might hint at during the question and answer period, and we will have time for question and answer period, yes? Okay, I'll, I better speed it up. So, uh, so my, my Malcolm, uh, uh, Mark Hempton once, you know, Mark Hempton, uh, who, was, who was a columnist and erudite columnist in Newsday, once said, he said, you know, my first uh, revelation was when I realized that I did not have to choose between Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughan. He said I could enjoy them both. And there have been a many of barbershop fights over this. And so I, similarly, I can say that my first revelation was to come to understand that I did not have to choose between Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. This is not to say that they were not contentious with each other, nor, by the way, did I discover at some charge that the perspectives and tactics of these two giants would have merged had they lived. I don't think that they would have quite merged because they were fundamentally different in, in profound ways. However, as was so often the case, Malcolm tagged it definitely when he concluded that the goals between the goals has always, the goal has always been the same with the approaches to it different between him and, Mal, and, and Dr. King. With Dr. King's Dr. Martin Luther King's nonviolent marches dramatizing the brutality and the evil of the white man against defenseless blacks. And in this racial climate, in this country today, it is anybody's guess, Malcolm wrote, which of the extremes and approaches to the black man's problem might personally meet a fatal catastrophe first. Nonviolent Dr. King or so-called violent me. As for the life's work of these two giants struggling against black oppression in America, it was King who wisely stated that's, and this is the point that really fundamentally separates them and I think kind of is, 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 the, is the cleft stick. King said segregation, being a southerner in Atlanta, 
Segregation gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. And I would add race instead of uh, just segregation. That racism in this country gives, imbues the segregator, the racist, the, the Nazi with a false sense of superiority and the people who are discriminated against over time because of the power factor imbue them with a false sense of superior, inferiority. Accordingly, Dr. King devoted his life works to dismantling the superstructure that was white America erected to protect this false sense of, superior, of superiority. Couldn't allow any competition because you might find out that you may not be so superior. You can't let them play baseball with us. We can't let them run for president because you might find out they are better even than Trump. <laughs> so you don't allow them to run for president, you see. You don't let them run for the Senate because they may be better than Sessions, all right? And so that's the whole idea. Dr. King spent his life and career and his life's work working against this citadel that was erected over time in this country to protect this false sense of white superiority. Now Malcolm, on the other hand, devoted his life's work to overcoming black America's false sense of inferiority. And that self-assurance and equanimity have yet to be achieved by all too many blacks struggling to overcome their conditioned sense of inferiority. This is the one of the things that I think continues to plague the country, and it's one of the reasons why Malcolm X is still so pertinent, is still so relevant, is still so much felt, and not just here in this country, but globally. So this life works of Malcolm X sparked decades ago is still being carried out on the banner across the globe by younger generations of oppressed people of color. Professor Hishan Idi of Columbia University has written a book called Rebel Music. I don't know if any of you have read it. But in it, he talks about how Malcolm continues to inspire global youth movements. In addition to Che Guevara, and Che Guevara, he argues, got his start from, and his movement from Malcolm. In addition to Che Guevara, Stokely Carmichael, and the Black Panthers of this country, Professor Idy cites subsequent Malcolm X-inspired leaders and youth movements in places such as New Zealand, Israel, Mumbai, Paris, Istanbul, Brazil, Rotterdam, Peru, and other parts of Latin America, which are still going on today. Much of this global revival had started and sustained by, of course, hip hop artists such as Chuck D, Gang Star, and the group Poor Righteous Teachers. I hadn't heard of them. Have you heard of them? Poor Righteous Teachers? Anybody heard of Poor Righteous Teachers? Oh, you have? Yeah. She's always into her kids, kids music. I kind of to turn it, give it a death for you. And in the past 10 years, Professor Ide said that a zeal for Malcolm X among urban youth has become something of a geopolitical barometer measuring young people's opposition to the political economy of exclusions worldwide. Malcolm X has become an avatar for this global youth struggle against exclusion and oppression. And at home, of course, Malcolm has long inspired, reassured, and empowered Americans across the board many of whom would never dare set foot in a mosque. I'd like to, with a few slides, review just a few of those devotees and people who were influenced by Malcolm that we may or may not know. Rosa Parks. And she said, I had a lot of admiration for Malcolm, and Rosa Parks said Rosa Parks, he was a very brilliant man. He was reportedly closer in philosophy to Malcolm X. She was reportedly closer in philosophy to Malcolm X than Martin Luther King Jr. Like her, Malcolm wasn't a supporter of nonviolence either. Now she met Malcolm, uh, Rosa Parks met Malcolm on three different occasions, uh, according to her biographer. And she attended his ballot or the bullet speech in Detroit, as well as the speech he gave in Detroit a week before he was killed in New York. And in the 1990s, uh, Chokwe Lumumba, the lawyer uh, and mayor of Jackson later, uh, in the 1990s, she reportedly shocked Chokwe uh, when he called her and she told him that Malcolm 
was her hero. Chokwe, you know, the radical, was stunned by this. Uh, she said she loved, she loved and admired King greatly, but Malcolm's boldness, clarity, and affirmation of what needed to get done for black people made him her champion. The point is she saw no contradiction in her admiration for both men, both leaders, and she saw no reason to choose, which was my first uh, revelation that you don't have to choose, that they were both existing in this country of crazy, this crazy quilt on the one side, white superiority on the other side, black inferiority. And so both of them were doing their work and they were the opposite side in some ways of the same coin. Another person that was influenced by Malcolm and the Nation of Islam was August Wilson, which surprises a lot of people, including me, <laughs> until I found it out. But then it occurred to me, and I've seen and read all 10 of his, uh, uh, the Decalogue of, 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 of his plays, and, and in fact, I've seen some of them many, many times. But uh, August Wilson in Pittsburgh, and I met someone here from Pittsburgh, well, yeah, someone, well in Pittsburgh now, uh, she escaped Mississippi <laughs> as I escaped Alabama. But, uh, but August Wilson, uh, of course, you know, he, he, was, he was dating a woman who was a member of the nation, and you know how that goes. So Robert, you know, he, he ended up joining the nation, <laughs> but he was never really totally into it. But he was, in fact, always influenced, August Wilson, by Malcolm X. And when you read him, and he was influenced by the nation of Islam, and when you read his work, when you read his uh, uh, historical view, of, 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 of the, uh, uh, the connection between the continent and here. Seven guitars and uh, two trains running in particular. And you, you'll, you'll find that evidence of that, you know, is, is pretty strong. And that quote, by the way, August was deeply impressed by the sound and cadence of Malcolm X and his speeches, though it is true from other sources, that quote is from her boy, who is not here, I don't know. Another person, uh, is Barry White. Barry White was the first singer, by the way, to sample Malcolm X. A lot of people think it was Chuck D. Barry White. Barry White met uh, uh, Malcolm, saw Malcolm when he was 14 years old and just couldn't wait to get up to him and, and the Fruit of Islam, of course, held him back. And he finally got up to him and, uh, and, and, and for the rest of his, uh, of his life was hugely uh, bass voice and all, uh, <laughs> impressed by, by Malcolm, again, uh, after being the first to sample his music. And he said here, meeting Malcolm, quote, was like touching greatness. I was at that moment inspired to reach for a new level of personal respect and fulfillment in my life. The next is uh, Chuck D, who we all know Chuck D, uh, who quite obviously and above board had been, uh, you know, from his early videos uh, promoting and demonstrating and exhibiting the Nation of Islam, and he was heavily uh, influenced by him. And so was his wife, uh, Dr. Johnson, who was a professor at UCLA. And, uh, and what she said about rap music, uh, what is rap music but a mastery of the English language? There is something, that is something Malcolm gave us. And this is one of the things that people miss about Malcolm. Malcolm was, you will, if you, if you listen to him speak, he all, almost never utters, you know, a bad sentence. And, uh, and, and it wasn't just uh, by ear. He, I remember he was talking to a New York Times reporter about uh, the book, The Loom of Language, which was he knew as much about linguistics as John McWhorter, you know, who, who's a PhD in the field. He was an excellent and, and he had this great uh, memory and he also had this mastery of the English language which is really not only the mastery of the English language but the voice and the ability to project and this is one of the reasons that made him a, an international uh, figure and, and so uh, persuasive. Who's next? Audrey Lord. She's laughing. My daughter made me put this one in. <laughs> <laughs> but she was heavily influenced. <laughs> she was heavily influenced by uh, When I read Malcolm X with careful attention, I found a man much closer to the complexities of real change than anything I had read before. 
hugely influential. And, uh, and, and, and this is what writers and artists and politicians and revolutionaries, and you look at the span of people that he has influenced over time and continue to influence among millenniums uh, across the globe. And then there's uh, Dave Chappelle, no more need be said about Chappelle. Uh, anyone who turns down $50 million <laughs> has got to listen to Malcolm somewhere along the line. <laughs> and the next is Ice Cube, who is, uh, in addition to being influenced by Malcolm, uh, Ice Cube, who is a rapper, songwriter, actor, he's a master of the scowl. Isn't that a great scowl? Have you ever, has anyone ever seen him smile? <laughs> when he's supposed to be laughing, he has his scowl on him. I, it's, he has like three different versions of the scowl. But anyway, he'd go from A to Z with the scowl. And then, of course, there's Chris Jackson. I won't say, of course, Chris Jackson, but uh, Chris Jackson uh, was, was, was a, uh, he changed his name to Muhammad Abdul Rauf, but he was a, a, a ball player. And uh, as I said there, Dave Brown, who was his coach, uh, gave me the autobiography for Malcolm X in college. Now, the thing about it, he, he was from mixed parentage. You know, he, was, he, was, he had mixed parentage and he was lost. He was trying to find himself. And I, in fact, I just came across uh, uh, an athlete recently who almost had the identical, not probably he plays with a team. I won't give his name because he hadn't given me permission, but he wanted to sit down and talk to me about Malcolm X and he wanted to, he ended up meeting, I ended up introducing him to Ilyasha, you know, one of the daughters. Ilyasha, who RSVP'd is in Detroit, she told my son she wouldn't be here for that reason. But at any rate, uh, uh, Chris, Chris, uh, Chris Jackson, you know, who, who uh, was a ball player and uh, his coach, who was white, knowing that he was seeking to find himself, gave him a copy of the autobiography of Malcolm X. And as he, as he said, that, uh, his life fascinated me in how courageous he was with the truth. The truth meant more to him than anything. I said to myself, this is the type of character I want to have for myself. And he said this was the reason that helped him find himself. And he was a basketball player. And what he did is that he, 20 years ago, I think, I mean, about 20 years ago, I know he did it. Someone's shaking their head, they know this, would not stand for the flag. He was suspended 20 years ago. He was suspended, he was punished. We didn't hear much about it. Well, some of us did who was following Chris Jackson at that time, but he was suspended, he was punished. He was a forerunner. He just very quietly said that he couldn't bring himself to do it. Not because Malcolm told him to do it, but Malcolm helped him find himself. And, uh, and this is the type of influence that he had on him. Then there's a rapper, Kendrick Lamar, whom I'm sure my wife knows. <laughs> but I uh, understand he's one of the hottest young rappers who is also heavily uh, influenced. For me, it's about communicating with people, going across the world and talking to other people from different cultures and walks of life. It gives you a different, a little bit more wisdom. Next, Attorney General Eric Holder. And you may remember when he left office, he said, they said, what advice would you give a young uh, poli po uh, politically minded person coming to Washington? And he said, read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And Breitbart went nuts. <laughs> As you imagine, they said, there it is, we always knew it. <laughs> oh man, they're still storming about that. Now, the, the, the story about, uh, about Eric Holder is that Eric Holder grew up in East Elmhurst, which is where Malcolm lived, and when he was 12 years old, uh, he, he, you know, that was a, uh, uh, he lived a few blocks from Malcolm in, in East Elmhurst near uh, LaGuardia Airport. And when he was like 12 years old, uh, he went and, uh, of course, he went to see Muhammad Ali. What, what happened is Muhammad Ali came to visit Malcolm at his house, and all the kids were in the street and, you know, and they went up, they were after Muhammad Ali. But while there, he got the autograph of Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. All right, both of them. Now, I've, I heard about this story, you know, and you, and you do your reporting and your research. And so I, I didn't get to Eric Holder, he was away, but I, I did talk to his wife and I asked him, was this story true? And she said, I'm sick of that story. <laughs> Uh, his wife, is, she's an OBGYN, she's a, she's a physician in, in Washington, she's an OBGYN, she's not sick of that story. She said, yes, he got the autograph of Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali when he was 12 years old, half stop. 
and his mother threw him away. <laughs> his mother threw the, the autograph that he got of both of them uh, away. So that's the way it is sometimes. And of course the other person is, and he wrote on White House stationery, and I don't have the permission to say who he wrote this to, but on White House stationery when he was a president, that the portrait, and of course we've read his biographies and we know what he thinks of Malcolm when he was in Hawaii and when he was a kid, but this is when he's the president. He said, the poetry of Malcolm's word and his uncompromising demand for respect had a profound influence on me as a young man. And so this is just the spread of people who have been influenced by Malcolm in their various ways. And what I'd like to do now if, to close is to uh, read a passage that, of, from an essay that I wrote about my experience uh, when I was in college. And don't start doing the math. <laughs> <laughs> you get it. When I was in college and I met Malcolm in Hartford, uh, Hartford, Connecticut. And first, let me set it up. I was born in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and during the apartheid, Alabama, I was born in the 40s in Alabama. And back then, you know, it was total segregation. Uh, and I remember when I was six years old, uh, I remember. Uh, telegram board delivering a telegram. Now some of you young people may not know what a telegram is, but it's a little yellow, it comes in this yellow envelope. No, <laughs> it's all capital letters <laughs> and they have stops for periods, you know, one of those. So anyway, <laughs> they, uh, a telegram board delivered a, a telegram. I was six years old in Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. They delivered a, a, a telegram to the house and, and it's one of the first times I'd seen a white person. You know, it's a white boy, he's maybe 16 years old, so he was a telegram boy. And my grandmother, whom I respected more than anybody in the world, answered him, sir. I was stunned. I mean, because of the inconsistency of it, you know, as a six-year-old. Because the rule was, the etiquette was, you, you say, you answer yes and ma'am to adults and to kids, 16 teenagers, you don't know, answer yes. And here's my grandmother who was answering. And it confused me. I didn't ask any questions because in those kind of Baptist Southern families, you didn't ask questions. <laughs> you, you, know, you, you just kept a low profile. Another time, uh, I was in a shoe store in a fairly young, in the summertime, and a fairly young person was uh, uh, waiting on us. And so I answered him yes and no, because he was, I don't know, 16, 17, whatever. And my mother slapped my face and said, answer him, sir. And I refused. Because again, it, it was a violation of etiquette. You know, I'm, in other words, I had not been conditioned by the South, the Southern etiquette into realizing that all white folks uh, answered sir and ma'am, and they called us Annie and John, and you know, that was the condition of the South. So anyway, so I, I went through this. This, this is, this is uh, my early childhood. And so I would let, like to tell you that I kept my resistance, but I didn't. By the time I was 12, we left. We moved from Alabama and we went, uh, my family, we, we migrated from Alabama and we moved to Hartford, Connecticut. And I had, ooh, I'm sorry, oh, okay. <laughs> and I had, I had by that time, you know, gotten out of my resistance to saying yes sir and all of that. I had become a real thin, down home, born again, Alabama Negro boy. I was 12 years old, I finished the eighth grade, and I was going into uh, the ninth grade in Hartford, Connecticut. And I was so turned around, this is a true story, that I remember I was in um, a geometry class, I was an honor student in the South, uh, but I figured, hey, you know, I went to a Hartford Public High School, which was 99% white, and uh, I was in a geometry class, and the first mark I got back, I got a 92. I was, you know, I like math. So I got a 92 on geometry, and I looked over to the left, and, and this white kid had a, uh, a 78. And I thought they had exchanged the papers. They had mixed up the papers. That's how confused this whole thing gets. This is, this is very personal. So what I wanna do, is to, if I may, is, is to read from the night I met Malcolm X. Can you hear me in the back, by the way? Oh, that was an echo. 
Okay. This was in Hartford. I'd moved to Hartford. I'm now in college. One night during my college days at the University of Connecticut, I came face to face with my own Negro psyche of self-loathing. It was June 6, 1963. Entering from stage left, the speaker of the evening loped into such a hush up front that his shiny Stacy Adams shoes could be heard clacking on the oak floor. Settling quickly at the lectern, Malcolm X clenched his teeth against a fresh challenge from the local newspaper to his status as a national black leader. His subject that Wednesday night in Hartford was, quote, God's judgment of America and the only solution to the race problem, unquote. He had been refining the speech since his homecoming appearance at Michigan State University four months earlier. One white childhood classmate from Malcolm's nearby, from, from nearby Mason, which is where he grew up, has stormed out of the auditorium, bewildered that this fierce Malcolm at the podium had shown no trace of Harpy, her gentle friend and president of her eighth grade class. That was his last year of formal education, an ordeal his English teacher shut down by berating him for aspiring to become a lawyer. The White Council proposed instead that 14-year-old young, 14-year-old Malcolm Little make peace with the birthright of a Negro and aim at becoming a carpenter. On the night of Malcolm's speech, I was among the audience in the half-filled auditorium at Bushnell Memorial Hall. Connecticut was Martin Luther King's country. The Southern Baptist preacher came to New England not to scorn, but to raise funds. And while King sought to change the behavior of the dominant white society, Malcolm conducted his scorched earth polemics all over the country, hell bent on countering, on counter rejecting whites as quote, blue eyed devils, unquote, while campaigning to change the mind of the Negro about himself. Recommending black self-help, Malcolm exposed the white hypocrisy of de facto segregation in Connecticut housing, job markets, and even higher education, higher education. At the time, I was one of less than 60 blacks among Yukon's student population of some 10,000. Even our basketball team was all white. I had first heard of Malcolm X in 1959 when CBS televised The Hate That Hate Produced, Mike Wallace. The image I had of the Muslim was of stereotypical ex-cons and bow ties shoving Mohammed speak newspapers into the faces of frightened white shoppers downtown. Among others, Woody Allen popularized this image in his spoof of a dubbed Japanese movie, What's Up, Tiger Lily? I don't know if you remember seeing that. I altered my opinion of the Muslim somewhat upon reading James Baldwin's essay, Notes from a Region in My Mind, in The New Yorker, an engaging rendering of the writer's encounter with Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad. It was later printed as the best-selling The Fire Next Time. On the night of the lecture, I noticed that Malcolm X alternated his flat reference to blacks with a qualified so-called Negroes. The former loosed a rustle of unreadiness among the brothers in the mixed audience. We were Negroes, thank you, and proud of it. Malcolm's revisionism was rejected as name calling that bordered on playing the dozens. For generations running back to slavery, black was pejorative, period. It conjured up evil, dirty, low life, unwashed, tarnished, polluted, squalid, inferior, and all the other negative connotations so well documented in the dictionaries of the early 1960s. This same year, for instance, 1963, a group of Negro students at a Toledo, Ohio high school staged an angry demonstration when the principal referred to them over the intercom as black students. Back home in Tuscaloosa, for example, whenever I would call my oldest brother black, 
though both of us were dark as Senegalese, <laughs> even Sudanese. Now, back home in Tuscaloosa, for example, whenever I would call my older brother black, though both of us were as dark as Senegalese, I'd have to run for my life. If I had thought of calling him an African, God forbid, John would have chased me all the way to Birmingham, which was 57 miles away. <laughs> no. Like every other Negro Baptist in the hall, I had, with the faith of little children, blindly accepted the handed down Christian tenet of American orthodoxy, including, deep down, our own racial inferiority that rendered us the most despised and self-despising citizens in America. Every jot and tittle of this credo bearing on race would get shredded this night by Malcolm's terrible swift sword. Since in the misplaced racial pride, as strong in Hartford as anywhere he had visited, Malcolm took pains to address the issue head on. And he had that way of talking at a lecture that everyone thought he was talking directly to them. Now, I know you don't want to be called black, he said, isolating his targets scattered throughout the mixed audience. I got the feeling he was speaking directly to me. You want to be called Negro. But what does Negro mean except black and Spanish? So what you were saying is okay to call me black and Spanish, but don't call me black and English. This simple, this simple analysis struck me dumb. Sitting there in my cushioned seat next to my Jewish roommate, Brian Steinberg from Yukon, by the way, a shiver of enlightenment swept over me. It was as profound as a haiku from a Zen master moving a Buddhist novice to achieve, to achieve Satori. After shovels of Muslim theology, horse doctor doses of racial counter-rejection, some BS about Yaqub, and trash talking about the blue-eyed devils, Malcolm had finally done the job with a verbal eyedropper. My mind raced back to Tuscaloosa and every parent and teacher urging that I was, quote, just as good as white kids, unquote, only to get contradicted by the American reality of the 1950s. The whites only signs rolled by, as did the Ku Klux Klan, the Jim Crow bus stations, the redneck sheriffs. All of it had been patched into a crazy quilt of white superiority with the adverse side, black inferiority. If Negroes were just as good, then why were we janitors and not CEOs, cooks in the US Navy, but not command commandants? Pickers of cotton, but not farm owners. Hewers of wood, but not managers of the timberlands. Where I had also wondered, as Marcus Garvey had once asked, are our black men of big ideas? The lightning Malcolm loose that night scored a direct hit on the tin shack of my own Negro psyche. Perhaps because he had personally undergone a Damascus Road conversion, Malcolm X was able to communicate and demonstrate with his life how Negroes like myself could throw off the damnable curse that blocks our potential and keep us from taking our rightful place among men and women on this earth. By the end of the lecture, I felt and knew that something within me had changed, this time irreversibly. Whites henceforth would no longer be superior. Blacks, most important, I, myself, would no longer be inferior. This cardinal message powerfully delivered to millions would make Malcolm X a treasure for black liberation and a serious threat to white America. Previously, my own conditioned sense of self-loathing had proved as difficult to remove as a tattoo and here it was finally washed away by Malcolm's acid bath of racial counter-rejection, 
a primer on racial conditioning and tough love logic. Until this June night, I had been imprisoned, but Malcolm X shook my dungeons, and as a poet said, my chains fell off. I had entered Bushnell Hall as a Negro with a capital N, and I wandered out into the parking lot as a black man. Thank you. Thank you.